As we continue our study of the ABCs of Christianity, we today come to the letter N. And as you probably have noticed in your bulletin, the letter N stands for new. New. You know, just a few weeks ago, I preached on the subject of love. And I quoted the words, Jesus' words in John 13, 34, where he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. And what's new in Jesus' statement is this. It's new in its quality. It's new in its freshness. And so it is, Christianity is a religion that is, that is new in all, I don't forgot the words. It is, it is new in its quality, right? It is, it is something that is a religion that it's, it's always fresh, it's always relevant, that's what's interesting about New Testament Christianity. Now, I'm one that truly believes that New Testament Christianity is good for all people. That it provides the answers to man's problems day by day. And that it's good for all people in every generation. No doubt about it. And likewise, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that which can go into any country, it can go into any culture, it can go into any custom, and it can work wonders. Now, I believe in Christianity, and I know you do as well. And so, what does Christianity provide that is new? Well, number one, Christianity provides a new name. I want you to listen to this passage that's from the Old Testament in Isaiah 62 and verse 2. And he says, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. I believe that is the name of Christian. Christian. Today there are those who follow Christ who are identified as Christians. In Acts 11 to verse 26, the disciples were to, called Christians first in Antioch. And so that's a fulfillment of that prophecy of what Isaiah had said in Isaiah 62 and verse 2. I don't mind being called a disciple of the Lord, but the name Christian it identifies one who is his follower, and why not wear that name? Why not? If we are going to be a people who follows Christ, and we recognize him as our Savior, surely we want to be called by his name, Christian. Why Christian? Well, after all, we understand the very purpose for Jesus coming, and it was for you and for me. Remember John 3, 17, for the Son of Man came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved? That's right. I don't mind wearing his name. Or in Luke 19, 10, where the Son of Man came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. Having been one who was lost, I do not mind wearing the name of Christ, of the one who saved me. And then, of course, I think about the passage in Acts 4 and verse 12, where Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What is that name? Well, it is the name of Christ. It may be considered a little old-fashioned, but I still appreciate a woman who desires to wear her husband's name when she marries that man. And so it is that we are married to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, 
It's a beautiful depiction of what a relationship between a husband and a wife ought to be. And then, of course, we find that the example that Paul gives us in verses 22 through 25 is that relationship that Christ has with his church. And the church is to honor Christ, just like a wife is to honor her husband, right? I do not know of a better way for a wife to, to actually honor her husband than to say, I want to wear your name. I want to be identified with you. And so it is. With, for us as Christians, we want to be identified with the one who, to whom we are spiritually married, that one being Jesus the Christ. But then also... We recognize that sometimes as Christians that we have to suffer for his name's sake. But notice what Peter stated in 1 Peter 4 and verse 14. We find right here that Peter writes, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, he says, Happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is speaking of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. In other words, all people suffer. But you don't want to suffer in that way. But he says in verse 16, that if any man suffers as a Christian... Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. And so sometimes we suffer because we have been identified with the one called Christ. And that's all right. Happy are you, Peter says. He may be spoke, evil spoken of on their part, but on your part, he will be glorified. And so, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed of that. Glorify God on his behalf. But to wear the name Christian, that new name that God would give his people, that also means that we have chosen his lifestyle as well. That we have chosen to follow his vision, that we have accepted his worldview and not the world view of him. We accept his view of the world. In Colossians 2 and verse 6, it reminds us, as ye therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The one who does that will be identified as a Christian, a follower of Christ. That's the new name given to us. But Christianity provides something else. Not only a new name, but a new covenant. Go with me, if you will, back to the Old Testament. And I want to go back to Jeremiah 31, if you will. That's the book right after Isaiah. Jeremiah 31, and we want to begin with verse 31, if you will, where Jeremiah then writes here, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, Although I was a husband unto, unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah has given us the words here of the Lord. And he says that there's going to be a, a new covenant that is going to be given. And these words that are spoken to us here in Jeremiah 31 
are reiterated in the 8th chapter of the book of Hebrews. But there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So, someone has said that the most misunderstood page in all the Bible is that white page that is between the Old Testament of Malachi 4 and the New Testament of Matthew 1. That's the most misunderstood page. So many times in my years as a gospel preacher, I've been asked this question by religious friends, and it, it is this. Why don't you folks believe in the Old Testament? Well, because they misunderstand something, don't they? I believe the Old Testament came from God, don't you? It was inspired by him, and everything written aforetime were written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. But we also have to discern between the, new, the two testaments and understand that we are under the New Testament or the new covenant of Jesus Christ today. But we also have to understand this, and I say this to my religious friends, please give me the opportunity to explain what I believe about the Old and the New Testaments and the difference between the two so that you don't have a misunderstanding. Galatians 3.19 reminds us of the purpose for the giving of the law of Moses. What was its purpose? Well, Paul first asked a question and then he answers that question. He says, wherefore then serveth the law or what is its purpose? He said, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now the promise, of course, was the promise of Christ Jesus. And in the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4, he would come. Now there's going to be a new covenant. But what was the purpose of that old covenant? It was to identify man's greatest problem. And that was sin. The problem of sin. But here's where the old covenant was weak. It had no means of forgiving that sin. It didn't have the means of it. Hebrews 10.4 says, For the blood of bulls and goats could not take away, could not forgive sin. And then in Hebrews 9 and verse 15, we're reminded there that there's going to be and was a new covenant. And that Jesus the Christ is the mediator of that new testament. And what is the key word in the book of Hebrews? Well, the key word is better. A better covenant. A better sacrifice. A better law. A better priest. A better priesthood. And so we're not talking about something that is just better, but it's new. It's the new covenant of Jesus the Christ. Now, what happened to that old covenant? Well, in Ephesians 2 and verse 15, Jesus abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That is likewise found in the companion book, in the book of Colossians, where in Colossians 2 and verse 14, we read, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us, that was against us, and he took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. Why did he do that? So that Jesus could provide a new covenant, a better covenant, under him, a new testament. Under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, there is full forgiveness. Under the, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, there is complete understanding. What was a mystery before has now been revealed in Christ. And under this new covenant, there are greater blessings for which we give thanks. But not only are we talking about a new name and a new covenant, but Christianity also provides a new birth. 
What is it that people need? Not just a boost from below, but they need a boot, they need a birth from above. I've heard some people, well, I'm a Christian, but not a born again type of Christian. Well, my friend, there's no other kind of Christian, right? There's no other kind. As a matter of fact, the term born again is somewhat redundant. You see, for the very fact that if a person has been born again, he is a Christian. And if he is a Christian, he has been born again. But to say he's a born again Christian is like to say he's a Christian Christian. It doesn't work that way. So one really doesn't have to identify himself as a born again Christian. But Jesus said, you must be born again, John 3, 3 and 5. But being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Now here's what's so wonderful about the new birth. Not only do you obtain the forgiveness of sins by being born again, thus becoming a Christian, but you know when you're born, you were born into something. You were born into something. And so it is those born again are born into something. Well, in Ephesians 2 and verse 19, it's interesting that the church of our Lord is called the household of God. That's God's family. And so when one becomes a Christian, he becomes a member of the church or part of the family of God. That is a new family indeed. Now, you might remember how Jesus identified his followers in, in the 12th chapter of Matthew. Someone said to Jesus, while Jesus was speaking, they interrupted him and said in verse 47, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Jesus said something interesting there in verse 48. He said, who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands towards his disciples. And he says, all those who were listening to him. And he says, behold, my mother and my brethren. You see? And then he says in verse 50, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. You see, that's why he could do that. He said, who's my mother and my brother? Well, right there is my mother and my brethren. Right? Because those who are my disciples, those who are doing the will of my Father, which is in heaven, these folks that follow me, they are my family. They are my family. They are my brothers and sisters and mother. And that's what you find in the church of our Lord. It is a family. A family of God. It is to be a family atmosphere that comes about through that new birth. Now in Mark chapter 10, Jesus gives us some comforting words. He assures us of something and that is that even though that we may suffer because we are his followers we still will come out ahead. It's guaranteed, verse 27. You see, Peter was asking a question about those who left everything and followed him. Verse 28. And Peter says, you know those of us who have been in your inner circle. Verse 28, he says, we, we left everything to follow you. I mean, we left everything. In other words, what are we going to get out of this? Well, in verse 29, Jesus answered, and he said, Verily I say unto you, that there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold, now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, here it is, eternal life. That's what's important. Some years ago, there was a very fine couple that had moved to Memphis to attend the Memphis School of Preaching from California. 
and this particular couple uh, were very friendly and outgoing and became very much a, a part of that congregation there at Forest Hill. And it was getting about the holiday time, holiday time of the year and, and uh, they were asked, well, I guess at this time of the year, you're going to probably want to head back to California to be with family. And the wife spoke before the husband. And she said, no. She says, but the problem is that we can't do that because when we became Christians, our family turned against us. They turned against us. They turned their backs on us and said, there's just no reason for us to return to California because no longer are we going to call you family because our family does not desire to see us. And so I began to say just how sorrowful I was in that news, and I, and I really was at the time. And I don't want to see families separated from their families for any reason. But all in all, she said, she says, it's okay. We have a new family. And that's the one here. We have a new family. We'll be fine. We found a new family in Christ. And then I thought about that passage there in Mark 10, 29 and 30. How many people have found this passage fulfilled in their lives when they have been rejected by the means of the new birth? They now have a new family, a new family in Christ. Christianity provides a new name, a new covenant, a new birth, which provides for us a, a new family. And then Christianity provides a new creature or creation. You see, how do we get into that new family, that family of God? by means of the new birth. And what does the new birth do? It makes us a new creature. A new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17, which was read a few moments ago, it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become, and here's our word, new and then reminding the Romans of their baptism and what that meant, he once again brought up things for them to think about. And in verses 3 and 4 of Romans 6, he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall rise to walk in newness of life. When we rise to walk in the newness of life, I ain't put off the old man. I'm a new man. I can literally say, I'm a new Charles. I'm a new person. I'm a new creature, a new creation. Christianity is about that word new. A new creation in Him. You see, Christianity will allow you to start that day over Again, Christianity allows you to start a new year over again. I love life. And I love the calendar and I love having 12 months in the year. And I love the time that we get to come to the end of that year and we go to a, a new year. And then I can start things all over again in that new year. Right? It's time to start all over again. That's why many times we make resolutions that are spiritual in nature. It just seems like a good time to make some spiritual resolutions as a new year is about to begin. But Christianity even lets you start life over again. Sometimes life is compared to writing a book, right? Maybe you don't like the present chapter you're in in your life, in the book that you're writing. But here's the point. That doesn't have to be your last chapter, does it? It don't have to be your last chapter. No, you can begin writing a new chapter at any time. During the end of the year, I enjoy a lot of the Christmas holiday productions that come out on television. You can get them on DVD as well. But I love that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Right? 
You probably do as well. But you know the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that stars that legendary actor, Jimmy Stewart, who, who plays the part of George Bailey. It's a Wonderful Life. And George Bailey is a unique individual, and he, he'd be identified before the movie is over as the richest man in town. But you know somebody that's sometimes overlooked and is his wife, Mary played by another great actress, Donna Reed. But when you think about Mary Hatch, she is someone who is very gracious. She is someone who is, who is wise. She's a stable character. Uh, she's interesting to me that very early on in the movie, you don't, you don't have Mary and, and another little girl named Violet sitting at that soda fountain. You might remember that. And back then there was a, a time when little girls could be safely downtown on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday afternoon. And little boys would work that soda fountain. And that's what George Bailey was doing at the time. And George was talking about all the things that he was going to do one day. And all the places he was going to travel to. And where he, where he was going, what he was going to, to build. And, but it was Mary who whispers in the deaf ear of George. And you might remember that George lost his hearing because of his brother breaking through the ice as they were sledding or skating. And Mary whispers into George's ear this. He says, George Bailey, I will love you for the rest of my life. Just a little girl, but you see, she knew what she wanted. George George has thought about all his dreams, what he was going to do. Nothing wrong with that as typical of boys. Mary already knew what she wanted. She wanted to grow up. She wanted to marry George Bailey, I guess because of all of his dreams, that he was a, he was a dreamer. Nothing wrong with that. She wanted to have a family. And she let George dream, but she always kept his feet on the gr ground. She would then become J Mrs. George Bailey. And one thing that interests me about studying her life as I watch that movie unfold is that Mary is always the one who had the proper perspective on things. She was the one. And she sees the potential in something. She saw the potential in George Bailey. And she even saw the potential of an old rundown house that one time was probably beautiful and charming. And she thought about it. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a family living here in that house? And it was accomplished, right? And at the end of the movie, she sees the potential in the townspeople. And when George is desperate and needs financial help, what does she do? Well, she rallies up to the townspeople, the people that he had helped through the years, and they came to his rescue. I want to say this. God sees our potential doesn't he? He sees our potential. The only thing besides his love that can help me understand why God would send Christ into this world to die for you and for me is this reason. He sees our potential in Christ. He sees not only what we may now know, but what we can become. And so it is when we become a new creation in Christ. Now I would challenge all of us to think about this when we see other people as well. And some of these people may be abusive. Or they may not always treat us right. But I would challenge you and encourage you to try to see those people through God's eyes. You see, those people have souls in need of salvation, in need of Jesus Christ as their Redeemer, as their Savior. We need to see their potential of what those individuals could become through Jesus Christ and His Gospel. I don't know what it is that would cause a man to become so deranged that he could walk into a school and kill innocent children Innocent teachers and administrators, it's evil, it's wicked. I can't understand it. I can't even contemplate it. I don't even have the words to explain it, what's going on there in the mind of that individual. But I do know this. 
I know this. Through great tragedy, there will be people who will shine brighter. Who will shine brighter than ever. Who will reach their potential like never before because it was tested in great tragedy. And I know this because it's true. And it's found in Philippians 4.13. Where Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He knew that to be true. He knew that nobody stood more in opposition to Christ at one time than himself. He knew how he, ought, how he thought he was doing God's will when he was persecuting Christians. And he sent them to the death chamber to die. He knew what he was doing, but oh, he said, I am new in Christ. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new because I am a new man in Christ. Can we say that about you? You see, Christianity provides for that, and so it is in Christ that we could be lights in the dark world, Philippians 2, 15. In Christ, we can be partakers of his divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. But here's our final point. Christianity provides for a new body. A new body. All of us understand that we have a body that is in constant decay. And yet our Lord has provided for us something wonderful. And that's a new body. A new body. You can't get that unless you're in Christ. But you remember the marvelous promise made in 1 Corinthians 15. That speaks of our resurrection day. You know we believe in that resurrection day because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who was raised from the dead. Romans 1, 4. But in verse 51 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? I will show you a mystery. There is a new body awaiting us on that resurrection day. And friends, only Christianity provides that new glorious day or that new glorious body. So Christianity is about what's new. It's about what's fresh and always relevant. It's about what's relevant, a new name, a new covenant, a new birth, a new creation, a new body. And you can enjoy these blessings even now. They're found in Jesus. And I urge you to, to follow through with those principles that Christ has already laid out for you and for me through his word but it's up to you you see what I have spoken today is to encourage you to be a part of that which is new always fresh and always relevant and that's New Testament Christianity but you have to make that decision I can't force you I can only encourage you but you know what you need to do to become a Christian by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, John 8, 24. To know that you need to repent of those sins, to turn away from them, Romans 10, 17, and, and uh, Romans 10, uh, 17, 30, and Romans 10, 10. We know that we, we have to make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ. Very important, uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. But then also to put the Lord on a baptism, to wash away those sins, Acts twenty two sixteen, to be able to rise, to walk in newness of life, a new child of God in God's family, Romans six three and four, and then to then live faithfully unto that end, so that we can have that hope of eternal life in heaven. Can we encourage you to come? Why don't you come? As together we stand and sing this song.